Thank you so very much, Mustafa Akil, for having a conversation with Afghanistan International. It's my honor. Thank you very much for uh, talking to me. So uh, you, years ago, you were quite optimistic, as long as I understand, uh, about uh, your own country, Turkey, and also about the uh, Arab Spring. So you were thinking that, you know, Muslims uh, can be, uh, can embrace the modern, you know, values, democracy, human rights, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, but it, uh, apparently it didn't happen. So you, were you too optimistic at that point? I was too optimistic about Turkey under Erdogan because I thought that their early phase of democratization and liberalization would be sustained, but they didn't. So I, I was a bit op uh, too optimistic about AKP, I think. The Arab Spring, too, came as, as a big promise, but then uh, today it's, it's a bleak scene in, in, in the countries that went through the Arab Spring, in most of them. Uh, but I will remind people that well, liberal democracy doesn't grow that easily. I mean, French Revolution happened in 18, uh, 1789, then there was dictatorship of the Jacobins, and there was Napoleon, and then it took many decades for France to, come to become something like a democracy. It's not easy. In America, began as a democracy. It had slavery in the beginning, and it takes almost a century to abolish that, then, then, then racial discrimination. I mean, societies don't really, unfortunately, grow into wonderful, open, free societies over time. You have to really work for it. Mm -hmm. So yes, I mean, sometimes we are optimistic and, and, and the hopes fail, but it's not a reason to think that these societies can never change. We, yeah, we've seen world going better or worse in, in different directions. And we should always hope. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, come back to uh, you know, Turkey. Uh, so do you think that, uh, so you are not optimistic as you were before about Turkey? about Erdogan and his policies. Does it have, his policy, does it have something to do with Islam and, 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 and uh, very uh, uh, strict and radical beliefs that he uh, somehow is promoting for his audiences or to provoke uh, people's uh, Islamic beliefs to gain momentum? He does, I mean, uh, Erdogan, Erdogan is not using Islam in the way, let's say, the Taliban does, saying, I'm an emirate, everybody has to obey with me. It's not that dark and it's not that blunt. Uh, he uses it in a way that populists use in, in, in democracies, which means, I am the good Muslim, you should vote for me if you're a good Muslim as well, and the other side is the enemies of Islam, like he's using this rhetoric, which is not true. Today, opposition parties in Turkey are also m made up of pious Muslims as well. There are some explicitly Islamic parties in the opposition bloc because they say, well, Erdogan is a pious Muslim too, but he went corrupt and authoritarian and we don't approve that. So mm -hmm. some people in the AKP actually broke away from Erdogan's ranks and joined the opposition. So it's not an Islam versus secular or Islam versus non-Islam campaign, but he points it, he wants to depict it like that because that's his populist narrative. So yes, Erdogan is using religion in an authoritarian way, but that, that, is, that is in a style that happens in democracies with populist leaders like this, but that's dangerous. I mean, in, 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 in India, we see uh, Prime Minister Modi using Hindu nationalism that is stoking up you know, excitement among the Hindu militants. Or, sure. But that's scary for Muslims, for example, in India. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Akul, in your opinion, what would be the vision uh, so for the Erdogan's government uh, when it comes to the countries in the region, uh, like Afghanistan? So we know uh, that Erdogan made some comments about Taliban. He invited the opposition group at, uh, in the past to uh, break a deal between Taliban and the previous Afghan government. Uh, and uh, so still many people say that Erdogan uh, is not scared to have a relationship with the Taliban, which is quite you know, extreme in Afghanistan. So what would be the vision for, for the future when it comes to Erdogan's government? What I see in the Erdogan government and the whole universe around it, the media, the, the, the half of the country, you know, that, that, that's a lot of NGOs, but their government policy is that I think they find Taliban too extreme on some issues. For example, they said it's wrong for stopping girls from going to school. We don't approve that. But on the other hand, they, sell, they may have some sympathy because it's an Islamic movement. 
they may have some sympathy because it's an anti-Western movement, because they pushed America outside of Afghanistan. Although Turkey is a member of NATO, Turkey is a member of NATO, and actually we were in the NATO forces in Afghanistan, AKP has this very bizarre worldview of both being in Western institutions like NATO, but also being very anti-Western in their worldview, and they can somehow try to manage these things. So, I mean, that's concerning. I mean, their sympathy for the Taliban is concerning. On the other hand, if they can manage to moderate Taliban sometimes on some issues, then that would be not bad. I mean, so somebody should talk to Taliban. I would agree with that. And if they talk to Taliban on some issues and try to moderate them, that's good. But if they justify what they're doing in their oppression, and then, of course, that's not good. And Erdogan does not justify Taliban. Uh, well, on, on, on education uh, issue, they made a statement saying that we don't approve, you know, the, the girls should be able to go to school. Other Islamic governments said that too in the Middle East. Uh, but, on, but they haven't raised a very critical voice as well. And I know some of Turkey's Islamic circles that became very influential under Erdogan, they sympathize with Taliban clearly. They sent a delegation to Kabul to congratulate, you know, their new government. So there is a concerning element. Uh, the thing is, in Turkey, uh, Erdogan will not ever try to bring a Taliban-like regime that's too far from Turkey, but there are Taliban-like minded people also in Turkey's very conservative Islamic circles, and they do have an influence, I think, on this government to some extent. Yeah, last question on this. So do you think that Turkey will play a huge role about Afghanistan's future since we have, uh, so of, of course Afghanistan and Turkey shared uh, many things in the, in the past historically and also uh, the, the, there are people in Afghanistan, a, a huge portion of uh, Afghan society, uh, you know, speak a Turkish language. So there is a, like a culture uh, heritage that, uh, you know, has been shared between these two countries. So do you think, consider that, do you think, Mr. Akul, that Turkey will play a big role, a serious role for Afghans, Afghanistan's future? Turkey can, and I think it will be good. I mean, despite the disturbing sympathy for Taliban among, let's say, pro-government circles, Interaction with Turkey for a country like Ta Afghanistan will be a vehicle to open up to the modern world to some extent. Uh, at the end of the day, I mean, if Afghans watch Turkish soap operas, I think that would be good. You know, it's a, it's a more free world where women are not necessarily forced to wear hijab or you have a more open society. If Turkey uh, make investments, if Turkey builds the airport or, I mean, so that, Turkey has some good things to offer and regardless of who's in government in Turkey, I think those things can be good in themselves. Uh, I mean, with Afghanistan, we have two choices. We, we can either see that Taliban is an oppressive, terrible regime and less isolated and suffocated, but it will only lead to more poverty for the innocent people of Afghanistan, I think. I do believe in as bad as Taliban is, as authoritarian, oppressive as it is, having channels to, to regimes like that uh, I think it's ultimately a good thing, and it can soften their approach to some extent. And Turkey, despite the disturbing ideological scene in Turkey, I think can be a positive, good, positive good. force for it. Okay, let's talk about uh, Taliban in Afghanistan. So, uh, Mr. Akul, so you know what, what Taliban are doing in Afghanistan nowadays. Uh, uh, banning girls from school is one example. It's quite uh, extreme and, and radical. So, and so many people, Afghan people, are disappointed uh, uh, by that. So, do you think, Mr. Akil, that Taliban are Muslim? They are Muslim. I don't doubt that. They're just Muslims who have a bad understanding of Islam. I mean, in, in, uh, I think in Christian history, crusaders were Christians. But there were violent people that did terrible things, and other Christians are looking at that with shock and dismay today. So I will not doubt that the Taliban is Muslim, but they have an understanding of Islam, just like the Iranian regime, that is very oppressive, and that's wrong from my, my understanding of Islam. So you say that Taliban are Muslim, but what they do uh, are not Islamic. What they do are not Islamic in the way that I understand. I'm sure they think what they're doing is Islamic. What they're doing is, if you ask me, uh, they 
impose what they understand as Islam to everybody by force. For example, uh, on let's take the issue of women, right? Uh, they believe that uh, women should not go alone without a mahram, you know, male guardian by themselves after a certain distance, right? Now, you can believe like this because there is a saying, hadith attributed to Prophet Muhammad about this, but there are different ways to understand this. Some people say, yeah, Prophet Muhammad said something against women traveling alone, so we should never allow them. But there are other scholars in Turkey and elsewhere, they, they will tell you, well, Prophet Muhammad gave a caution about that because at that time, it was dangerous for a woman to go around in uh, Mecca and in, in the desert, uh, Arabian desert. Today, we live in a different world. Prophet Muhammad's concern was security. So if there's no security concern today, they should be able to go around. So that, that's another interpretation. So in an ideal world, what should happen is that you can say these are different understandings in Islam. Let people follow what they want, what they believe, right? If a woman thinks she should not go alone, it's her choice. She can stay at home. But other women say, we're fine. You know, we don't, we, we, our belief in Islam doesn't stop us from going around or they should be able to do that. So they are Islamic, uh, they are using Islam to impose their mindset to on everybody else. And that's tyranny, that's dictatorship. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that that's not Islamically justified, if you ask me. Okay, this is interesting. So, so we have uh, a Taliban that are Muslim, uh, as you say, uh, so, but uh, have a different interpretation of, of Islam uh, and Hadiths and Sunnah. And we have Turkey, we have Iran, different Muslim countries and different Muslims. And then question is that, Mr. Akul, who has the authority to say that this is the real Muslim and this is not the real Muslim. Who has that power? Nobody has that power. And that's why uh, the solution is letting people follow what they think is correct for themselves, but not impose it through the government on everybody else. If you think, as a Muslim woman, you should wear the burqa, you wear it. If you think a burqa is not necessary, but hijab is fine, you wear it. If you think I'm not gonna wear a hijab, that's my choice, that's your thing. And the government doesn't take one of these views and make it the law that everybody, everybody has to follow. We need what, you know, what's called in the Western world separation of religion and state. Right? So let me, let me uh, ask you this again. So for instance, I'm not gonna compare it, but it's, there is an example. In the Christianity, there is, is Pope, right? Yeah. So, but we don't have such figure. We don't have a figure Islam, like that, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so, but what experienced Muslim in different countries, including in Afghanistan, who had the power, the force, uh, uh, claimed that he has the authority to say to others that you know what is a real Muslim and who is a real Muslim and who is not a real Muslim. So that has been experienced in years and years and years. And Afghanistan is a clear example now under Taliban. So this is a problem. Uh, I mean, your example is good. I mean, in Christianity, you said there is Pope. Well, in Catholicism, there is the Pope, right? In Protestant Christianity, there is nothing like that. And there are many different interpretations of Protestantism, right? There is the Lutherans, the Calvinists, the, the Swedish church, the, the American, a lot of many things like the Anglican church. So how do you make Protestants live together without op them oppressing each other. Well, that's the story of the United States. When they were founding the United States, they said, let's just separate religion and state. The state should protect everybody's rights and security. Let people follow whatever interpretation of Christianity they want, let them follow that. And for that, they go and open a church themselves. Some of them are like the Amish, they can reject technology, they can be very conservative. Some can be more progressive. It's their choice, right? The government doesn't dictate. So our problem in the Islamic world today is that governments say this is through Islam and I'm dictating it to you, right? Taliban dictates Talibanism. It, it, they say Islam. No, it's, it's your Islam. It's Talibanism. Iran dictates uh, Ayatollah Khomeini's interpretation of Shia, Velayat Faqih doctrine. If you go to Saudi Arabia, they dictate Wahhabism. Uh, I think a government should simply protect citizens, their basic security, basic services. Religion is your issue. We're not going to describe what Islam is to. Then within the Muslim community, 
we should discuss. Yes, some things are un-Islamic. I mean, killing innocent people, is. there should be certain limits, of course. We cannot say anything goes in Islam, right? Killing innocent people, torturing people, violating these things. I mean, or theologically, you can't worship an idol and saying, I'm a Muslim. So there are limits. Mm -hmm. But other than that, there are so many interpretations and understanding of Islam. There are many Sunni uh, interpretations. Sure. There are Shia interpretations. There are modernist interpretations. Let Muslims follow what they want to follow as individuals, as communities, but let them not coerce, force uh, the, their interpretations on other people. So let them accept freedom. Yeah, in another word, you're saying that, you know, the government or governance should be separated from religion. Religion yes. is something that uh, should be practiced privately. Ex privately or publicly, but not officially, right? Not, not as a law, for example, let me give you one example. Uh, the Taliban breaks musical instruments, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Why do they do that? Well, they believe music is haram. You know, that's a religiously banned. Now, uh, I don't think music is haram, if you ask me. There's nothing for it, against it in the Quran. And yes, there are some medieval views. But I think my interpretation is that it, at the time, maybe music was too much uh, associated with debauchery or maybe pagan practices. Mm -hmm. So some scholars at the time saw music connected with that, and there are some hadiths that interpreted in that direction. I personally don't think music is a haram. Many Muslims don't think it's haram, but, but Taliban thinks it is haram. So what the Taliban should do? My advice to them, if you think music is haram, good, then don't listen to music. It's your choice. We're not going to force you to listen to music. But no, they want to make everybody think like that. They want to break other people's musical instruments. So that is the problem. I don't have people being very conservative in their uh, interpretations and living in the way they want as long as they allow other people to have their ways of life as more, as less, as less strict Muslims or purely secular people too. I mean, they have their human rights. Everybody should be able to live as they want. And there is no good in forcing one interpretation of Islam on others. You're just creating dictatorships in the name of Islam, uh, you are actually making people leave Islam, detest Islam. I mean, Ira the Iranian regime uh, forces women to wear the hijab. They're burning the hijabs on the streets. They're not becoming more religious. They're actually becoming a reaction. Uh, they are showing a lot of reaction against that imposition. Yeah, as you mentioned that Iran uh, is perhaps the, one of the countries that uh, produces the most uh, ex-Muslims. Ex-Muslims, yeah, Iran, yeah. because. If you create a dictatorship in the name of Islam, if you torture them for that, if you beat them, if you uh, f uh, punish them for not being in the way you want, uh, you will not make them fall in love with Islam. You will actually have the exact opposite of impact. And that's happening in Iran. Yeah. So it's happening elsewhere too, yeah. Yeah, let's stick with Afghanistan. So in Afghanistan, Taliban are saying that, you know, uh, we, uh, we are going to shape our government uh, the way that they think uh, is Islamic. And they refer to some hadith and sunnah and some, some religious interpretation of, of Quran and, and Muhammad's life. Mm -hmm. So they said that, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is uh, something that has been practiced in Islamic uh, uh, culture through history and f started from uh, Muhammad's uh, uh, personal life uh, so up to now and that's why they, they think that they have the right to uh, do uh, the way they say like uh, to, to, to enforce people uh, the way they want as a, as a part of the mm -hmm. governmental mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, exercise. Mm -hmm. Well, you're right, and uh, that is the mindset of Taliban, that's the mindset of the Iranian regime, that's the mindset of a lot of Islamist movements around the world. They believe Islam is din wa dawla, or religion and state. So they think Islam requires a certain kind of state, and they have to do it. I don't believe, like, I don't believe that as a Muslim. I believe Islam has political principles and values. I think Islam requires justice. But justice can be achieved in any state. You can find more justice in America or Sweden or Norway or some Western liberal democracy today than most of what you can call Islamic, Islamic societies. There's a beautiful story. I mean, in the beginning of Islam, uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he and his first Muslims were persecuted in Mecca. By the way, 
Islam didn't begin by establishing a state. They began by just preaching the Quran, right? But later on, they yeah. established, formed a sort of government. I'll come to that. In, Islam began in the city of Mecca when Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, began preaching Islam. He didn't say, I'm going to establish a state next year. That was not a part of the idea. He and his first Muslims wanted to be able to preach Islam without being persecuted. But the polytheists persecuted them, killed them, tortured them, threatened them, boycotted them. Because of that, they had to find a way out. And one was, ultimately, they fled to Medina. Yeah, yes, they established a state there. But if the, if the polytheists didn't persecute them, they would not need it in the first place. Mm -hmm. So the state was not an integral part of his mission. It was just incidental, right? It, it had to be founded just as a temporary issue. And there's another thing Prophet Muhammad said to some of his followers, go to the kingdom of Abyssinia, that's Ethiopia. He said, there's a just king there and you will be safe. Uh, was this an Islamic state? No, this was a Christian state. Muslims went to that Christian state. They indeed found justice there, which also includes religious freedom in, in today's terms. And Muslims ha lived happily in Abyssinia without being, it being an Islamic state because they only needed a state in which they can safely live and practice their religion, right? Mm -hmm. And they were able to do that. So today, all those people who say we want Islamic states, they're just imposing on us their mythical understanding of this Islamic state based on a few hadiths that they interpret. But I think a lot of Muslims, including myself, we believe that Islam is not a state, it's a religion. And religion needs safety, security, justice, and, and religious freedom. But these can be achieved in any states. And we look at the so-called Islamic states and some of the secular states. Secular states are better. By the way, you say some hadiths are, are, are fake, right? In the, in, uh, did you mention that in the, uh, in the past somewhere? I mean, I, I discussed the authenticity of the hadiths. That's a big uh, question, of course. I mean, in Islam, of course, we have the Quran as the basic source of Islam. That's all Muslims believe in the Quran. I believe in the Quran and the authenticity and the divinity, the divine origin of it. When it comes to hadiths, these are sayings attributed to Prophet Muhammad. The hadiths were canonized almost 200 years after the Prophet's passing. And it was an oral tradition before. So when you hear a hadith, it, is, it comes from a person A, B2 to C, and it goes like that, and there's a chain of transition, uh, to, to transmission. And uh, they were written down. So, and much of the Sharia comes from hadiths. Much of the Sharia that today uh, is in tension with human rights, uh, apostasy laws, blasphemy laws, that women should not be able to uh, go around freely without a mahram, or women should always obey their husbands, uh, or music should be banned, uh, or people should be flogged for drinking alcohol. All these kind of uh, punishments that are controversial because there is something unconscientious about them when you look at from a, from a, let's say, neutral point of view. They all come from hadith. They don't come from the Quran. Uh, and that's why in the 20th century, many Muslim scholars began to question how authentic these hadiths really are. Yes, our classical scholars, Imam Buhari, Muslim, they canonize these things, but and saying that these are the authentic ones. But even the authentic ones could include some forgeries or maybe some mistranslations, misinterpretations, maybe, because ultimately it's human memory. It's not like the Quran, which was preserved from the very beginning. So I do believe in questioning the Hadith literature, not as a disrespect to the Prophet of Islam. Uh, we would never do that. But we, we're not sure whether he would say that. And taking the Quran as the ultimate guide. The Quran, if the Quran says there is no compulsion in religion, la ikraha fi din, right? That's a very important Quranic principle. And when I see a hadith which says kill a person who leaves his religion, that is compulsion in religion. So when I, I take the Quran as the more definitive source over this alleged, you know, uh, report from the Prophet Muhammad. So uh, we need hadiths, they are a very important source of information, but a more critical look at hadiths by using the Quran and reason mm -hmm. as a guide uh, is the approach that I share. And the various Islamic scholars sure. in the 20th century, 21st century have sure. argued for that. Mr. Akul, if we use reason to justify our behaviors, so what we do, if we 
are able now, after years and looking around other people's experience in uh, some countries that have like godless institutions like United States and other people experienced, went through a painful experience. If, if, if a young Muslim now think that, you know, this is like uh, banning girls from school is not rational, it's not justifiable, it does not make sense at all. And then why he needs to look back and for some confirmation in in this hadith and Quran and in the roots of Islam? Why such? Why, why he or she needs to do that? Well, of course, uh, from a religious point of view, there are limits to what reason achieve. Everybody will say that. But for example, through reason, we cannot understand is there an afterlife or not, or what does it look like. So there are some aspects of religion that is beyond our common sense and our empirical understanding of the world. However, you ask a very good question. How can we organize society? How should we have a state? Uh, what kind of the state should look like? Should it be a monarchy, a republic? Should there be elections five years and four years? Like, I mean, these are all questions and human mind, human reason can answer these questions. Uh, because some Muslims think that God gave us a revelation and, and, and the Prophet's example in 7th century and that's it, everything is finished. That solves every question. That's not the case. Th that's not what the Quran says. The Quran says the Quran came as a guide to believers, a guide to, uh, guide to going to heaven basically, to be saved in afterlife and to be a moral person. It doesn't say, tell you, I'll give you a de good definition of government for centuries to come. The Quran doesn't speak about that. Yeah, sure. So I think we Muslims undermined, in, this, in the Sunni tradition especially, the the authority of human reason, which is also a God-given faculty. I mean, reason doesn't come from the devil, it comes from God, right? I mean, God created human beings, that's what we believe, and it gave us reason to also make moral judgments, to test things, understand what's right and wrong, and with that, humanity can establish political systems. Uh, humanity develops something like democracy, which is better than tyranny. How do we know that? Well, by testing, I mean, by, by seeing the results. So uh, I think, uh, and I believe the Quran left a lot of areas in human knowledge to reason. The Quran doesn't define a government, so it's left to you. you, you can, but the Quran tells you to be just. We, sh we know that the government should be just, and that doesn't change forever. So one question on this, one more question. So some people may say that, you know, uh, reason in, in the uh, history, uh, Muslims experienced uh, living for years, there were some people like Ibn Sina who had structured thoughts and reason-based uh, uh, thinking. But some people say that, you know, some, someone like Ibn Sina's thoughts and, and the way they were thinking doesn't have any deep connection with Islam. Islam, they were, they were inspired by other sources like, you know, uh, philosophers, Greek yeah. philosophers yeah. and so on and so forth. So it doesn't have anything to do with Islam. They were themselves were under pressure by uh, mainstream believers, Muslims. Yeah. So, uh, and then uh, Islam is a, a collection of Hadith, Sunnah and, and, and yeah. not, not more. Yeah, that's the origin of Salafism, you know, what you're describing, very true. You are quite right to remind us that in the medieval era, uh, in the second, third, first, second, third, fourth centuries of Islam. Actually, we had a very open-minded approach to human knowledge. Islamic philosophers like Al-Farabi, like Ibn Sina, uh, Al-Kindi before them, then Ibn Rushd, uh, they studied Greek philosophy, right? They learned a lot of things. They, they got some political ideas as well too. Actually, Al-Farabi wrote a lot about political science from today's perspective. And he discusses the importance of freedom, hurria. Mm -hmm. And he says in cities where there is freedom, all kinds of talented people come to those cities and those cities flourish. So he writes that, which is a kind of description of a open liberal society and how it makes progress. That's in writings of Al-Farabi. Uh, we, we had those great thinkers. Now, they didn't say, uh, they got those ideas from what, Aristotle or Plato? They didn't say these are kuffar, unbelievers, right, infidels, so no, nothing worth to study. No, they realized that, well, they are not Muslims, but they have the God-given faculty of reason, and reason is universal. So you can learn from something from that thinker. You can learn today something from other thinkers, from Hayek, from Karl Popper, from this 
from Habermas, whoever. And there's, I'm not imposing a one line here, just uh, because there is, besides revelation, God has given humanity uh, the senses, the rationality, and by, by using those, we humans can agree on basic values, basic goods. We can develop an international system of human rights which is better than a system of slavery and a better system of constant warfare, for example. These things happened, and I think, unfortunately, uh, by an obsessive attachment to merely texts of the Quran and Sunnah, and by a little understanding of those, we abandoned the more rationalist approach in Islam. This happened, I mean, in the Sunni world to some extent. The, the interesting thing is that I believe the Quran itself calls us to use reason and to be more open-minded. If Taliban's interpretation of, of Islam and Hadith and, and uh, Deen, as we say in Farsi, is, uh, is wrong, so why we uh, don't uh, see uh, a, 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 a clear uh, um, uh, protest from other Muslim countries? Why there isn't any Muslim country to stand and say this is uh, not Islamic, this is not acceptable, doesn't have any root uh, in the Islam, uh, in Islam, in Quran, in Hadith. So what we, do, we don't see that. Well, two reasons. First of all, uh, some of the things they're doing is in the mainstream Sunni doctrine. Let's be honest about that. I mean, I'm critical of those. But the idea that there should be a religion police, hispa, you know, forces imposing understanding, that is in, in medieval Islamic texts. So that's why some Sunni scholars around the world do not say anything against the Taliban because they think, you know, what they're doing is justified. They might not be publicly saying that in their own environments, but unfortunately that's what they think. So we have a problem there. On the other hand, on a few things that they went really extreme, like banning girls from school, I think they were criticized even mildly, you know, by some other Islamic uh, scholars or uh, let's say statesmen at least, a few. Uh, I do believe that um, scholars who live in the West, Muslim scholars who live in the West, who see the blessings of a free society, who see the importance of education, you know, they should be the ones who s go speak to Taliban. Like, uh, you don't expect the Pakistani clerics to change a, a Taliban on that. Maybe they don't think too, too differently from them. I mean, Pakistani Sunni clerics. Well, like, I mean, Bandis, let's yourself say. an example. So you have been writing about these issues for years. Uh, so you have written a few books, so I would like to hear about your books and about your opinion how effective your work has been for Muslims uh, uh, in that part of the world. Thank you. I have a couple of books. Uh, one of them is actually translated into Dari recently. It's available in Afghanistan. The English title is Why as a Muslim I Defend Liberty. It's a small summary of my ideas about freedom and Islam and how they come together from a Quranic perspective. Uh, and, you know, our viewers can maybe, you know, have access to it uh, in Dari in, in Afghanistan. Uh, also, it's freely available in English in uh, libertarianism.org as well. Uh, now, I, I'm not trying to convince the Taliban. Like, I mean, they're not going to listen to a person like me who is not even a sheikh or imam from, from the same religious, you know, establishment background that they're coming from. And I'm not giving any religious fatwa or I'm not an authoritative, I'm not a cleric, right? I'm a Muslim writer, a, a journalist, thinker maybe, who's kind of trying to open up minds in the Muslim world about some of the burning issues of Islam today. I'm not going to change the minds of Taliban, but I might try to appeal to the young Muslim who doesn't know where to go, right? I'll, I maybe appeal to a young Muslim who's actually unhappy with the Taliban, but doesn't know another way of looking at Islam. So I'm appealing to that person. Mm -hmm. Will Taliban read my books and change their minds? I would be happy to do so. <laughs> yeah, sure. but, but also, what should happen therefore is there are established clerics like, uh, who have uh, titles like sheikhs and, and uh, faqihs and ulama and all that who are living in Western societies, who see the blessings in these countries, who see the value of freedom. I call on them to sometimes 
go and appeal to these people and try to make them realize that they're not doing anything good, you know, by their zealotry, by their fanaticism. Yeah, sure. So let's uh, end uh, our, our conversation uh, with this question. So if your audiences are uh, mainly or partly young Muslims uh, in that part of the world, uh, what is the next, what is the best way for young Afghans for their future who are desperate for freedom, but they have to live under Taliban's regime right now in Afghanistan? In the past 20 years, uh, there, were, there, there was a lot of opportunity in Afghanistan, many international uh, communities, you, NATO, ISAF, uh, the United States, but those uh, chances and opportunities were, are, are lost. Uh, they are gone. So what, what, is, what might be next for them, and in, in, in your opinion, what's the best way for them to seek a better future for themselves? Well, I don't want to sound arrogant by telling them what to do because I'm not in such a difficult position of living under the Taliban and I respect them, I, I respect their disappointments and, and uh, frustrations. But still, if I may say a few things, I think developing yourself, investing in yourself uh, and looking into opportunities for business, for uh, education, for anything to strengthen yourself as an individual. I mean, in the Muslim world, we're always told, join this big movement and that big movement will be uh, the savior of the Muslim world and so on and so forth. No, invest in yourself. And opportunities may arise. Maybe in five years it may arise. Maybe you will leave Afghanistan and find a different life in some other country. Maybe you will continue in Afghanistan, but you will be an agent for change. Maybe even under the Taliban, there will be some softening over time. Maybe you can, even under Taliban, you can open a company that produces uh, textiles and at least give something to Afghan people, some affordable things. Or if uh, you can open a company, invest in the market, invest in business, try to bring food to people that is affordable and employ some people. So even if there is an authoritarian regime and it's frustrating to live under, if you don't give up and invest yourself and look around for opportunities, you can find a way uh, to do something. Uh, do that and just don't allow Taliban to define uh, Islam for you. You know, it's between you and God. Nobody can tell you what is right and wrong uh, without, unless it comes to your conscience, your own understanding of your religion and, and uh, your own connection to God. Mustafa, I really enjoyed con this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was my pleasure. I hope to see a free Afghanistan. Yes, inshallah. absolutely. Thank you.